Hello everyone, my name is Theo Gidry. I'm the co-leader of the Black Student Union. And I want to thank you for joining today as we continue to celebrate Black History Month. Today we are going to have a discussion about a sensitive topic, but a very relevant topic, and that is racism. That is something that is plaguing many countries, not only the United States, but especially the United States. Um, racism disproportionately affects Black Americans in a negative way, and today we're going to look at that um, through a different lens, through an economic lens. Um, this is why we come to SICE. We come to SICE so we can understand policies and the ramifications of those policies. Um, racism plays itself out in many different ways economically, in the housing market, um, in uh, hiring and salaries. Um, but racism doesn't just affect Black Americans, it affects many minorities. Um, and today we'll touch on that. And I'm really, really excited to get um, our speaker in today. Um, but what are the economic costs of systematic racism? And that is the element of the article of Joe Velasco. And I will introduce him now. So Joe Velasco is a 2015 science graduate. He was an ILA concentrator. He got his BA from the uh, University of Southern California. He now works for the World Economic Forum. He's been there for the last five years. Uh, he primarily leads initiatives uh, and produces thoughtful leadership on international infrastructure and development topics focusing on technology, financing, and sustainability. And for those of you who don't know, the World Economic Forum is an international organization that focuses on public and uh, private cooperation and is committed to improving the state of the world. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Joe Velasco. Did I get your name right? I'm sorry about that. Uh, Lusavio, but you story Lusavio. about Lusavio. It's, it's sorry about that. <laughs> uh, but thank you so much, Theo. It's great to be here back at SICE um, with you. Great to be here. I even see one of my old uh, coworkers, Julie Stover, who is now at SICE, uh, is online. So um, great to see you and all you folks here. And really excited to get into this conversation today to, you know, talk about um, the role of uh, racism, systemic racism, and how it, uh, you know, affects, um, you know, all of us. You know, anti-Black racism is really, you know, I think the major focus of this and really uh, kind of the most pervasive and deepest form that we see in the world. But really, um, you know, the what, what we'll get into later and why I decided to, to write this piece and what I think a lot of us wish that more people understand is that racism is bad for everybody. It's not just bad for the people that are being discriminated against. And there's, you know, a lot of ways uh, that, you know, we, people should understand how they have a stake in this fight uh, to eliminate racism. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and just go through some uh, quick numbers from our from the article that I wrote, but also first just give some background on myself. And uh, Thea, we can see the screen, right? We're all good? Okay, great. We're good, go ahead. Great. So as you were saying, uh, I'm originally from Louisville, Kentucky. It did my uh, undergrad, and apologies for any of the, any um, typos on screen. I grew up in the spell check era and I just assumed computers will fix all my spelling errors for me. Uh, so apologies in advance, but I'm originally from Louisville, Kentucky. I, as you said, I went to University of Southern California for my undergrad degree, focused on international relations, global business, and East Asian languages and cultures, and then uh, graduated from SAIS in 2015 um, with my concentration in international law and organizations. Not sure if that still exists, uh, but uh, it was great while it was around. Um, and I've been working at the World Economic Forum uh, since 2015 here in New York City, and I'm currently a specialist in our cities, or in our uh, Internet of Things and Urban Transformation team focused on um, infrastructure development, infrastructure technology adoption, and strategic urban planning. So um, the reason that I decided to uh, write this article was, I think, you know, the reason that a lot of us decided to become more vocal about this topic was that we were seeing what was happening. Uh, we saw what happened to George Floyd, this thing was happening around the country, and we were all just kind of sick and tired of the way things were going. And, sick and tired of the same conversations happening and people just not really getting it and not really understanding why this was something that was just foundational to, un to society to address. Uh, and so 
uh, I went to our media team at the forum who, to their credit, said, you know, we're uh, a bunch of white people who went to the same boarding schools in the UK, who all went to Oxford, who all grew up the Financial Times, and we really just don't know how to cover this in the right way. So they were, you know, willing to let me write an article that included a lot of my feelings for our uh, internal uh, forum blog, which were external blog, but it was, you know, internal to the forum. Uh, and after writing this, uh, one of my former classmates from SICE, actually, so this is why that SICE network is so important, who was working at the International Monetary Fund said, hey, we've, you know, some of us have been talking internally, we really wish that more international organizations would take some kind of stand on this. Um, we have a quarterly magazine that really talks about these issues in an economic lens, and if you were to kind of convert this to more of that economic lens, I think it would be good that and so that's what I did I connected with the IMS team uh, and they published my article and uh, we have next is kind of some of the things that uh, I focused on in there um, to both show kind of the systemic nature of racism in the United States around the world and the effects on technology and a lot of this particularly in the US section was to kind of build that understanding that uh, you know, it's everywhere. It's in everything. It's not just in, you know, the way that um, Black people are, you know, treated by police. And it's really just not as obvious as somebody saying a racial slur to you in a public place. It's just deeply embedded in American society. And that, you know, the so policy solutions that are often given uh, across the spectrum are just insufficient. You know, on, on the right, you have a lot of people who just say, racism ended after slavery ended or after the civil rights era ended. And really, if you just pull yourself up by your bootstraps, if you work hard, put your head down and you invest your money right and make the financial decisions, everything will be fine, which uh, ignores the fact that many people were not given the correct decisions to make. Um, and then I think on the left, you have a lot of people that just say, well, this is really a class issue. And if we just solve the class side, you know, we're wasting too much time dividing people on race. If we just fix the class side, bring everyone together, um, then, you know, all boats will rise, which really ignores, you know, the different levels that we're starting at and doesn't address um, the, the existence of racism in itself. And so the way that this kind of played out for the U.S. is that, you know, some, these are some of the statistics that I used in my article, that Black Americans are twice as likely as white Americans to be killed uh, by police while unarmed. And uh, 20, uh, one of the more shocking ones was 29% of white first year American med medical students um, thought that black people's blood coagulates more quickly than white people's blood. 21% believe black people have a stronger immune system. A lot of them just think that black people feel less pain, which affects the kind of just, uh, prescriptions we get for our medical care. So we're less likely to be prescribed um, painkillers uh, because, uh, you know, a combination of the fact that often people just assume that you want the drugs uh, or that you're not really feeling the pain and that you're just being uh, dramatic about it. And this is one of those things that, you know, for instance, uh, a single payer uh, public medical system does not solve the problem that 29% of white first year medical students think that black people's blood coagulates differently than white people's blood. Um, and, you know, this manifests itself in real world ways in that um, racist medical notions contribute to black women in America being a third more likely to die of heart disease than white women. And then, you know, black family uh, median income uh, is 10 times less uh, than the wealth of the median white family. And this comes from a lot of the things that Theo was talking about earlier, like redlining, um, which, you know, for that argument that, well, if you just make the right financial decisions, if you just invest in the right places, well, if you're not allowed to invest and your investments are not allowed to accrue value because you are black, then obviously that's not something that's gonna happen. So um, this is what racism looks like in the US. But another thing I wanted to, uh, discussed with the article I wrote is that this isn't just a U.S. issue. And I think what you're seeing a lot more now is the increasing awareness of this as a global issue. Um, and, you know, for all of its faults and all of the ways that the U.S. has handled it, I think it's really shed light on how far behind uh, a lot of other countries are in acknowledging uh, this is a problem. And, um, you know, I'm sure some of you uh, this being sites have been to or live in currently or have lived some time in Europe and have seen that in Europe, uh, it's, you know, a, a strange point of pride for them to say how much less racist they are than the United States. 
um, but this is often something that you hear from white Europeans and not Europeans of color. Um, and you know, one of the places where this is really starkly exemplified is in France, uh, where it's actually very difficult to even collect statistics on this because the French have this national ethos of colorblindness. Um, everyone is French. It's all about the kind of uh, you know ideas behind Frenchness, not about color. And so we don't need to collect statistics on race because it doesn't matter, which really just ends up leading to things not being recorded. And so uh, it's actually very difficult to get statistics like this because the French are so loath to record them. But um, you know they have the same kind of issues with police violence. Certainly not as bad as it is in the United States, but. Uh, young men perceived as being black and Arab are 20 times more likely to face identity checks by the French police, um, whether or not, you know, your immigration status. 20% um, of young black or Arab French people report being the victim of brutality in their most recent interaction with police, which is a number, only 8% of white French men um, have the same experience. Uh, and there's also a good amount of microaggressions. One of the things that did make it in this article, but I found very interesting, was the idea that um, uh, Black and Arab Frenchmen um, are more likely to get uh, tout toi monted, which is, you know, in, in French, where you have a polite form of you and a formal form of you. Um, white, which, so the formal form is vu, the familiar form is tu. White people will get vu, people of color will get tu, which is essentially, you know, Call it, and not people aren't getting a sir, they're getting boy, uh, which happens much more often with people of color. And men perceived to be Muslim uh, by employers, which is, um, you know, in France, because they don't record statistics on race, you just kind of have to correlate uh, the way that they associate religion with race, uh, which is often North African or Sub-Saharan African and Middle Eastern. Uh, men perceived to be Muslim usually by their names are four times more likely to get a job or four times less likely to get a job interview than people who are described as non-Muslim or Christian and job applications with Arab sounding names get 25% fewer responses than those with French sounding names. So it's also just as pervasive in French society and many French people would say they're less prepared to deal with it because they refuse to acknowledge that it's a problem at all. Um, and in Brazil, which is another very interesting example because um, uh, instead of thinking that they're a colorblind society, uh, they think of themselves as uh, a very uh, aware society and kind of tell themselves this fiction that they never needed a civil rights movement because they just abolished slavery and they just immediately went to multiracial um, representative democracy, uh, which is um, really glossing over a lot of the deep discrimination that exists in Brazil today. Uh, and you know they have a kind of interesting outlook where they see uh, countries like the United States or countries like South Africa as obsessed with race. It's all, it's all you can talk about. And if you were just like us and just kind of moved on, then it wouldn't be a problem. But uh, in 2012, 13% of Afro-Brazilians over the age of 16 um, had received post-secondary education. This number was 15 points lower than for uh, white Brazilians. And Brazil also has an interesting kind of categorization of race. There's very few people who are um, fully black. It's a very mixed society, but there's a, the majority uh, of Brazilians are of mixed race um, with most of that being um, black. And so between mixed race Brazilians and black Brazilians, they are the majority of the country, which you wouldn't know if you were looking at your average Brazilian government delegation um, or Brazilian C-suite in a company. Um, and uh, you know, I, a lot of uh, what Brazilians like to chalk up their issues in race to is class. Um, but uh, what we see when uh, there was a study done that compared sets of households that uh, had twins in Brazil, and you know, because it's such a mixed race society, sometimes there will be twins where one is very uh, is more obviously black than the other one is. And even in those households where one was labeled white and one was labeled black. Uh, there was a distinct disadvantage in educational attainment, particularly if the twin was male for the non-white twin. Um, and in 2018, uh, police violence in Brazil, which is shocking in and of itself, but there were uh, 6,220 people killed by police in Brazil, which I'm not sure the number off the top of my head of the US, but it's far, far lower than that. Uh, police violence in Brazil is its own separate problem. Um, but despite representing about half of the national population, 75% of those people who were killed by police in Brazil were black. And in 2019, the average income for white workers was 
75% higher than that for black and mixed race workers. And even at the same levels of educational attainment, Afro-Brazilian men made only 70% of comparable white man's income. And for Afro-Brazilian women, that was only 41%. Uh, and, you know, as we kind of saw through all this, this has huge uh, economic penalties for everyone, not just for the people experiencing the racism. In the United States, uh, the black wealth gap, uh, and this is from a report uh, that was put together by McKinsey by another SICE grad, Nick Noel, who was uh, my year at SICE. Um, the black wealth gap is projected to cost US economy between 1 trillion and 1.5 trillion in lost consumption and investment between 2019 and uh, 2028, which is 46% of GDP. And in France, um, GDP could jump 1.5% over the next uh, 20 years by reducing the racial gaps in access to employment and work hours and educational attainment. And between 2001 and 2011, lest we think this is just a problem uh, in the US and in South America uh, and in Europe, it, it would cost Australia um, 44.9 billion Australian dollars. Uh, so, you know, it's a pervasive global issue. It has implications for all of us. Uh, and, you know, I think it's something that really merits a discussion. Like Theo was saying, that's why I'm so glad to be here talking at SICE is that, and particularly um, to members of the Black Student Union, because a huge part of this is just getting people who look like us into the places where they're making decisions. Because, uh, you know, a lot of this is in some ways just um, passive path dependence on the way policies are done unless there's somebody in there to say stop this is a real problem um, we don't have those ways to remedy the situation so um, I wrap up on the numbers portion there and uh, really glad to be here and Theo I'll throw it back to you yeah thank you for bringing the numbers and the statistics very illuminating and I saw Andrea uh, already uh, entered a question for us. So I just want to say that the Q&A function is open for people if they want to go ahead and ask some questions. But I did want to follow up with you, Joe. Um, you talked a little bit initially about the impetus behind the article. Um, obviously, we've had instances of George Floyd, George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor. But racism isn't new. It's been around. Um, it's very prevalent in the United States. It's something that it's been talked about, but it's also talked about at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit why you wanted to do the article? I mean, was it before all of these instances of George Floyd and that was the kind of catalyst or was it kind of something you've been wanting to do for a while? Yeah, I think it's something, and you know, when people say that they think this time was different, um, you know, I don't think it means that it's going to cause massive change in, say, the way that, you know, cities contract with police departments and things like that. But, like, what it did do was really just pull down a lot of the walls that a lot of us in the professional world were putting around ourselves in the way that we talk about racism. Um, and, you know, centering it in the work that we do, which is particularly important in a place like the Forum, and I think, um, to their credit. And, you know, just to say up front, I'm speaking on behalf of myself, not of the forum, but uh, um, allowing us to build it into the work that we do and not having to say to ourselves, like, oh, I don't know if I'm going to have, if I'm going to meet a bunch of pushback, is it even worth it to try and really like, you know, for instance, the work I do is around infrastructure and urban development. And obviously the, the way that cities were designed in the US or really around the world that just uh, intentionally and unintentionally reinforces um, racial, systemic racial injustice. Uh, you know, I wanna center that in the work I'm doing. Is that gonna be a problem? And I think what I've learned to now is that it doesn't matter, I'm gonna do it anyway. And um, I've had a supportive team that has been totally okay with that. And in fact, said that we wanna, we wanna make sure that that's the issue of the work we do. So I think that's just all to say that um, what happened this summer really just made me say, you know, this, instead of thinking to myself, is this even really something the forum should be talking about? It told me, yes, it is. And I want to bring it up and I want us to be talking about it. And they agreed, which uh, something I really appreciate. And I was glad I got the opportunity to do it. And glad that the IMF was also um, willing to uh, publish this as well. Um, Cause I think that, you know, we were in the article, I went after, specific countries. And I think that was something that, you know, could have been con of concern to them, but they were willing to, you know, uh, put up with this piece. So, yeah. 
I mean, speaking about that, um, one thing I really liked about the article was the, how you did go at specific countries because too often I feel like the conversation of racism centers around the United States. And, you know, we don't get statistics about France and Brazil. I mean, we hear about it, um, you hear about it in South Africa, but the way you kind of went through it was very illuminating. Um, and I just wanted to know, like, why was it important for you to really bring in the other country aspect to the article? Yeah, I think it was really just to really prove that point that this is a global problem. And also I think um, to show that, uh, it, I think this actually gets at the, what the question I see in the Q and A, um, which is, you know, do we think this is high, that highly visible racial tensions in the US is preferable to the more covert stances of countries like in France? And let me know if, um, uh, let me know, Andrea, if this if my answer is not what you were asking. Um, but I think what it has done is a, a big problem in other countries I found when I was researching this is that there's not a lot of consciousness of, of race, which, uh, you know, in the U.S., obviously, the consciousness of race has led to, you know, a lot, it led, led to slavery. I mean, it's it led to a lot of really bad things. But what it has also given us is the ability to come together as a community to fight for the rights that we have. And all, with all the problems that the United States has, I don't know that there is any country in the world that has um, a traditionally marginalized minority that has as much power as Black people have in the United States. And that's because Black people fought tooth and nail, uh, got out of the streets, got made their way through government, used the levers of government to really consolidate that power. But a lot of that was because, you know, society was like, you're black, you're not good enough. And we're like, okay, well, then we're just going to form consciousness together and prove you wrong. And that's not something that's existed in a lot of other countries. Um, and in the cases of France, really, you know, it's just been kind of layered over this uh, civic nationalism, which is something that is generally good, I think. I wish more people in the United States had more civic nationalism and less ethnic nationalism. But, and, and by people, I mean white people. But, uh, in France, it's, you know, it's also led to them just kind of being ignored as a category. But in Brazil, um, it's just this idea that people don't think of themselves as Black if they have the tiniest amount of, of, of any blood of any other race, which is interesting because in the U.S. it's kind of one drop rule is that if you're any percentage Black, you're categorized as Black. In Brazil, people are striving to be white. Uh, so um, this has, I think, this has provided the opportunity for um, black people and other minority groups in other countries to have consciousness um, of what's being done to them as a group uh, and band together to demand change. And I think you saw a lot of that, um, especially in Brazil, or I'm sorry, in France, um, where over the summer, their Black Lives Matter protests actually became very prominent, very heated because they were, you know, they were saying to themselves, we've had enough after all these years. Uh, and in Brazil, it's interesting, we, um, at the forum we had our Davos agenda last week, uh, one of our big announcements was creating this uh, task force. And it's my, my colleague who works on this unfortunately couldn't make it. I mean, he sends along his regards. He really wish he could. He's on um, vacation this week. Um, but this a task force of, among uh, companies to you know put some meat behind the words of these pledges that they've made regarding uh, racial equity. Um, and one of the places, you know, we post these online, we track them on social media, and one of the places where it did the best was Brazil, which was hmm. pretty interesting from our perspective, because it's kind of a, a subject that it's not much talked about, but clearly people are hungry for change. So um, I think that's bringing in those other countries and those other perspectives was important. And I think, you know, how that connects to the question that was asked, uh, Andrea, was just that it's really important to raise their consciousness and really important to not let anybody think that they can sit on the sidelines and say, look at those racists over there. Because, you know, right. it, every, it's a thing everyone needs to be, you know, minding, minding the house on. We have another question in the chat from Tracy. Uh, she asked, in your study, were there any countries that were doing well moving towards racial equity? Um... That's a tough question. So, yeah, I didn't, it's tough. yeah, I mean, because I think we don't really know what that looks like. I mean, it's it's strange to say that in my perspective, you know, that's the United States because you, we have increasing representation of Black people in government um, uh, in ways that you don't see in other countries. I think 
you know, like I was saying with Brazil, if you look at the demographics of the country and who you would walk into a boardroom with, which is similar to it is here, but even if you walk into a, a, an assembly there, I don't know that you would find the level of diversity that you would find here, which obviously doesn't mean we have an enormous, enormous amount of work to do. Um, but I think there's those levers in society um, that people are really taking it upon themselves to use. Um, so I, I guess the, the answer to that is that I don't know, um, but I think that it's, you know, it's encouraging to see the way that everyone around the world, I think, is taking it more seriously and making it part of the conversation. I mean, the fact that at an inauguration, the president was talking about systemic racism. I mean, if that had happened in the 1990s, you know, I think they would have impeached him the next day. So right. uh, progress exactly right. is is in fits and starts, but um, I think here's one way to say, and we'll see how this plays out for other countries like France and Brazil. Um, are they taking seriously the needs? And I'm actually kind of worried about the way things are going in Western Europe. Um, I think they've always told themselves that if they had the level of diversity in the United States had, they would handle it so much better. And I think what you're seeing is they have, they don't even have the level of diversity the United States has in terms of a racial and r racial diversity, and they're not handling it any better. And it alarms me that unlike the United States, where I think we had a critical mass of people of color um, and you know white people on the right side of history, that we were able to kind of stop this backslide. And I don't know if in Europe they have enough people to prevent that, especially in this age of social media, where these you know people often say if Fox News existed when Nixon was president, he wouldn't have been he wouldn't have resigned. You know, I think that it exists now in different forms. And I think that's something that worries me a lot. Yeah, I wanted to touch back on what you said about corporate pledges. I see a lot of people making corporate pledges. Um, you saw City do a study. Um, what, like, pledges to me are performative sometimes because it's just like you make a pledge and then you don't hear much about it afterwards. Can you just speak to... Like, I guess um, the corporations will come to the forum to get some, like aid, like, aid in making some of these pledges. Like, how do you guys help these corporations, like, develop some of these pledges um, when you see these things? Because it seems more, like, performative. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think the, uh, you know, one of the reasons that companies come to the forum, because I think to sometimes to an outsider, it just kind of seems like a, like a lobbying organization, but you know, you can you can just go to AmCham or the US Chamber of Commerce if you want lobbying, because that's all they do. They'll go and they'll sure. say we want these taxes lowered here. But you come to the forum because you're trying to understand how the world is changing around you and to make sure that you don't get swept away um, in the change because you weren't prepared for it. And so I think that what the forum does is um, convene the right groups of people to help understand what needs to be done to, to, to meet this future that is happening um, and where that needs to happen. And, you know, they've done a lot of work. They started, you know, we used to convene, a lot of our communities are CEO communities. We'll convene the CEOs of financial services firms or chief strategy officers. And I know they've begun convening chief diversity officers um, to try and come up with more common ways to address this industry-wide and economy-wide um, and sector-wide, because I think it also looks different by sector, of course. Sure, of course. Um, and I think they are working, and from the work that I know that's going on, on my colleague David's team, who's the one who's doing a lot of this work, I think they're trying to, what are, what are the more things they're trying to do is add metrics. Um, so and instead metrics, of just yeah. saying we have these pledges, just be like, okay, well, here are these metrics that you need to meet if you're serious about this pledge. Um, and, you know, we understand that metrics are hard to meet, and you're not always going to do it, but you need to have something to measure your progress. And then we want to find ways to help you with that if you're not meeting your progress. But um, and that's what I think when we'll know that they're serious is like you were saying, there a lot of times it's just PR. Um, it's really easy to put up the hashtag BLM and put a slick ad together. But if we don't have the metrics. Put an ad together, your social media, black out your social media, put a campaign together. Yeah. Um, we have another question from Chazelle. She asked, what is your experience collecting and finding data on this topic? Multi-part question. What would you say some of the gaps in the way countries collect information that could lead to positive change? If there are any shortcomings that come to mind, are there any practices you've seen 
intentionally about collecting data and usually utilizing information to create change for the black and other minority communities. So a very multi-part question there. Yeah, so um, it was dependent on the country. For the US, it was pretty easy. Um, I mean, some of the like collecting statistics on police violence is difficult because they don't want to keep statistics on police violence. But the US um, collects a lot of statistics because it uses them to make decisions, a lot of demographic statistics because being a multiracial democracy, um, they, they need to use them to make decisions, um, which, uh, you know, of course, over history has had its good and bad points because sometimes it's used to make very bad decisions like Redline, but also it helps you rectify decisions that were made in the past. And in France, it was so hard to find meaningful statistics to, sh to show the impact on technology because even the numbers I have on the how much it would help GDP if you um, leveled out the playing field a bit. It was, I had to do, those weren't statistics, statistics I could just look up and put in. I had to do the calculations myself because they wrapped it up in so many other things uh, that it took a lot of time to separate out specifically, you know, the, the black people and the Arab people because they, were, they lump it a lot of times in with the way the women are treated, which is obviously an extremely important topic, but it's also a way to say that like, well, you know, um, we also have a problem with sexism. And so these are kind of the same thing. And why don't we, you know, we can address them in the same way and it kind of co-ops a different set of problems so that someone else could have the microphone. Um, and so th I think that the hardest part um, was finding statistics in countries like that specifically where there's low consciousness of race where they just you know don't want to believe that it exists and so um yeah that's what, and also in europe there's there's a taboo on collecting statistics on race and ethnicity because of world war ii which is fair um I, it's the first thing that comes to mind for a lot of them um mm. and you know i think it's time to evolve on that position because you're not going to be able to fix the problem but you know in some ways i can understand why they can be so hesitant to do it in the first place sure um sure. And, and i don't if i Giselle, if there's anything um i missed i kind of rambled there so please let me know if there's something else that you that you asked and i didn't answer um great uh, we have a couple more uh questions coming in in the chat i think you kind of touched on this a little bit but i that you asked about. Can you speak a little bit about Francis' idea of karunatismo and how it ignores the problem of racism and uh, discrimination towards Arab and Muslim communities? And that's pretty huge in France, I know. And then you are, you've already mentioned that it's hard to get data out of France, so. Yeah, uh, it's, um, and I can actually tie this with um, I have a second question about how communities were built to keep specific groups further away from each other than others, because it's, it's, it's a very visible problem in the US, but it's also a problem in Europe um, and, and in South Africa, I think we all know as well. Um, but so yeah, that, that idea um, uh, of France of, um, I can't pronounce it, but uh, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah it, it's really something, it's interesting because if you talk to a lot of, uh, of the most liberal right Frenchmen about it, they will tell you. Um, that there, you know, if we really just need to focus on being French, and we're all in this together. And I have lots of Arab friends, um, and uh, it's a very, it's like a society wide taboo that uh, you know we don't talk about race because it just it creates a problem in and of itself. While you know, as we saw with these numbers, um, there are plenty of other signals that people can use to know what your race is without seeing you and kind of you know discriminate with people in that way. Um, without doing it openly. And, and the names one is the big one. And it happens a lot in Europe, you know, in, in the UK, I remember there was a big scare a couple of years ago that the number one most named name was Muhammad. And, you know, yeah, that's interesting. I that. not, like, we're, we're, there's, I don't see any headlines of the number one name. name is, it's, it's Catherine, you know, there was a reason that it was a huge, it was a huge deal for a country that it prides itself on being the least racist one in Europe. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's a big, it's a big issue in France. And I think a lot more, a lot of groups are trying to address it. And a big problem is that they're not, just not very visible um, in society um, at large. Which is something I think that the United States and the French, in France share in a way that Brazil doesn't. People are much more 
Brazil is a different problem where black people are very visible in society, but just in certain roles. In the United States and France, there's a lot of segregation. Um, and, you know, you'll see uh, people of color, you know, in society, but, uh, you know, they also have built cities. They say not intentionally that very much separates, um, you know, people of different races. And I think it's interesting in the, in, in the U.S., um, traditionally, the inner cities where, where all the um, poor minorities were clustered. In France, it's in the suburbs. So the suburbs around Paris um, are very densely populated with people of African and of Arab descent and of other um, marginalized minorities. There's a lot of Roma there, the people that we traditionally call um, gypsies, Roma. There's a lot of them on the outskirts of Paris. And they have terrible city services. Um, yeah. And they're... Uh, they're discriminated against in the work that they get. I had a colleague who used to, she's British, she taught, um, she taught in a French school. She's younger and she said that if you had a certain address for a certain neighborhood on your job application, they just went ahead and threw it away. Um, and you know, wow. it's, it's, you know, the way it, it, it's a city that's kind of built to design to keep those people um, away from everybody else. And it's similar to the way that cities are designed in the US where um, in addition to redlining, where they just kind of a government, I can't remember which government agency, but just kind of decided that these neighborhoods were not going to provide the kind of financial assistance. Um, and we're going to categorize, yeah, and categorize them in a way that makes them really bad investments and so that they don't get any value out of their houses. And then in, in these ones, so all these white people are basically getting all this assistance from the state to make their property more valuable, um, which builds their wealth so that their next generation comes out wealthier than the next generation of black people. That was an active decision by the state and the way that we you know, built highways almost always right on top of black neighborhoods to bring people in white suburbs where a lot of them uh, were not allowed to buy houses uh, lived in, in here in New York, out on Long Island in Levittown. I think it's still in some people's lease that you can't sell your house to a black person. Um, and you know, the way that, you know, uh, that that overpasses were designed on Long Island were meant to keep buses at the time from being able to get out to Long Island on the highway. And so um, city design uh, is, has a huge effect on uh, systemic racism and keeping people apart, keeping people poor. And I think it's one of the reasons that it's so galling that you see the way uh, that gentrification unfolds, which I think is not necessary, you know, I don't think gentrification in and of itself is a bad thing. Um, or, the, or the fact that people are moving into these neighborhoods. It's just often the way that it's handled and the way that the communities who are already there are completely ignored um, is, you know, very wrong. They're not integrated into the decision-making process. They're not engaged at all. And I think a lot of them would be um, very happy to, you know, welcome all these new people in if they were just consulted in some way when they build some new apartment tower. I think it's a similar situation with, the, with the police, that black people aren't anti-police, they, they would just like to have a stake in how they're being run and would just please like you to treat us like we have civil rights. And it's not that much to ask, but um, yeah, I think it's just galling that you have all these people whose parents were you know, active or inactive, but still participated in this divide, moving back into the cities and then just kicking them out of their homes after then they were treated as valueless and now they suddenly right. have all this money. Um, going back to the article, I kind of wanted to see if you've had any feedback on it and whether it has it been positive, has it been negative, um, has it been received by the community? What is the thoughts on it? Has it sparked more conversation in your community, in your circle? I think it has. And it's, uh, you know, I think it's sparked a lot of people have told me, you know, similar to you that they didn't realize that this, that this problem was so worldwide and pervasive and um, provide some form of solidarity with people. And, you know, I think it's interesting that, um, you know, when the U.S. talks about itself as a, as a shining city on a hill, and there's a lot of examples to lead by, and in, in a lot of ways we fail that. But in, in, some, in the civil rights movement itself, and in this movement now, there are a lot of other places that are looking to the U.S., um, for guidance on looking at the Black Lives Matter movement for, right. for inspiration. And I think that's something that as Americans, we should be proud of. Like that, we, it was against uh, a particularly American problem, which was that deep level of systemic racism in the US, but that it was a problem that Black Americans who built this country got up and said, we're tired enough and a lot of people in other country 
are looking to benefit inspiration. Um, the, uh, every time the IMF posts this on their Twitter, and then because they'll at me, um, yeah. the replies are, I have no doubt that most people like the article, but the most of the people that feel the need to comment are not those people. And sure. some of the stuff is just bananas. I mean, there uh, people are out there. I, I, I have to assume that on um, stuck to a piece of the wall on their desk are the statistics on how many on the level of crime that black people commit and why it's okay for them to be killed by the police because it's always the first thing uh and um a lot of international reaction uh that is um you know more of the same you know you're dividing us in the race talk i feel like strangely yeah. uh and you know i'm uh, my family is, my dad's family is Italian, so I'm half Italian. A lot, there's always a lot of Italians that have a big problem with these articles uh, from Italy. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it's, it, it shows you how far we have to go and how, how prickly people are about the subject and how they're just not really internalizing the main message is that like, we want to solve this problem because it helps everybody. It's not just something that helps us, exactly. it helps you too. And to sit here and want to ignore it just really speaks to, and I think we see this a lot in the U.S. these days. We saw it, uh, you know, when a bunch of right-wing terrorists attacked the Capitol, is that there are a lot of people who would, who would, who don't, re whether or not their lives get better doesn't matter that much. They just want to make sure that other people's lives get worse, or, or at best, they just don't, you know, I want to be considered equal to them. Because I think, you know, a lot of this movement, that people misinterpret is just, you know, they want special privileges. Nobody is asking for special privileges. No. Uh, we're just saying there's a lot of things that, you know, there's, there's inequities that need to be corrected and that's gonna require more investment in one community than the other, but we can't pretend that wasn't happening in reverse before. Um, but, uh, you know, we want we want to make this whole multiracial democracy thing work. So any anytime you want to come and help us out with that, we're ready. And that kind of goes into uh, another question in the chat from Sabrina. Um, where she says many decision makers seem to be have more of an affinity for policies that promote equality and neglect to address equity. How do we remedy this? Yeah, and I, I just hear I was I, I kind of want to uh, add to this because the NPR just um, did a story about reparations and reparations is a, another sensitive topic that people kind of talk around and has been thrown around in the last 10 years. Like, it, I like Sabrina's question because it addresses a lot of things. How do we get more equity in some of these policies? And like, how do we ensure it? Um, we can't just say, you know, they make a pledge. How do we hold them accountable, you know? Yeah. And it plays out, and like she said, in addition to reforms in education, healthcare system, labor markets, best practices. Um, what do you believe would, would be some form of wealth transfer? Yeah, and Sabrina, I think that's a really good question because it's, um, and to, I, I'll be honest and say, I don't know much about the way that the reparations conversation itself is on. Right. But um, I, the, and, so, and I also just, I don't know how I feel about it as policy, but what I do know is that it's pretty, it's pretty funny to me that it's treated as this, as this idea that like, I can't believe we're just assume, we're just gonna shovel all this money towards black people as if we have not been implicitly shoveling all this money towards white people for 200 years. So, um, you know, you have to modify policies for the time, but to start the conversation as if this is a crazy idea and special treatment is ignoring all of history where um, white people have been given in this country just obvious monetary and financial uh, advantages from the government. Um, and so, you know, I, I agree that I think that the, the, it's high time the conversation moved from equality uh, to equity because um, equity is how we're actually going to really uh, make equality happen, I think. Because sure, we have equality um, before the law in the letter of the law, but that how does, you know, how does that play out with police departments? It's certainly not, we're not certainly equally distributed. Giving black people equity um, in the form of power within uh, the way the decisions are made for police departments or within the police departments at a much higher level than it's done now because of course there are black officers in, in black individuals in police um, uh, departments, but that doesn't mean that police firms aren't systemically the racist. Um, I think that's the only way that we're gonna get to real change in society is improving the amount of 
real equity and correcting the imbalances because um, I think you see, you know, there's interesting examples of this around the world. Uh, one of the primary ones being South Africa where they are now questioning, there's a very interesting um, foreign affairs article or foreign affairs edition a few maybe years back at this point that talked about how countries were addressing, you know, past traumas and things like this and when what's working. And the answer was nobody's really doing it great. Um, uh, but in the South African example, they talked about how a lot of black South Africans feel like, you know, we just decided um, instead of having a civil war, we were just going to say, tell us what you did. We'll have truth and reconciliation. We just want to know where our family members are buried and then we'll move on. Um, together and just figure it out as it goes on. And are now going back saying, were we too gracious? Did we not demand enough of the wealth that was concentrated in the hands of white people be moved to black people? Um, because we can't pretend that it's unfair if we give it to black people, if that's exactly what we did to white people. And they talked about, but then they talked about in Rwanda, how they did a lot of kind of forcing people to work together, how they gave people, right. uh, um, like you had equal, you, you and someone that, you know, was a blood enemy, had an equal stake in a business, which has worked in some ways, but it's also, you know, they, sometimes they feel like they're just constantly reminded every day of the genocide. And it's just like, we, we want to, we do want to move on. So this is to say, Sabrina, that I don't know what the answer, I know that there needs to be more equity. I don't know um, what that looks like right now, other than just really fighting for uh, a seat at the table in every sector, in government, in business. Um, I know that it's hard for people to speak up when they're in a company because I, I've, I'll say I'm lucky and have a great boss and a great team and they make it easy for me. I wouldn't, you know, there's some, you know, I'm sure there are teams that I wouldn't expect them to feel as comfortable as I am and I wouldn't ask that of them. I wouldn't say that you have a duty to do this for all of us because I don't have the same circumstances that it's unfair for me to ask that. But I do think as CISERs who are all gonna go on to do important, amazing things. I think that's why it's good that you're here and that you're ready to go affect that change because I know this sounds a little bit hopey changey, but it's, <laughs> I think the more you feed people into these systems, the more they change, so. No, I agree with you. And we wanna leave on that kind of hopey changey <laughs> sentiment <laughs> just because, you know, this is a sensitive to uh, topic, but you know, we wanna always try to think of it you know, there's things we can learn to move the conversation forward. So um, there's another question in the chat, another one from Andrea. Um, you working on another paper or project on race and economics that we should be on the lookout for? Um, is there any other um, black or uh, uh, black economists who you would recommend reading? So I am not, I'm specifically on the topic of race, I'm not working on anything else because this was really just something that I was, I was just mad and wanted to do. But it's definitely something that I'm trying to integrate into the broader work I'm doing on urban development. And so hopefully, um, I can't remember who, uh, who asked that earlier question about kind of the role of city design. Um, but I'm, I'm hoping to address that in the work that I'm doing. Um, and I'm hoping that more people at the forum in general uh, kind of make that move with the work that they're doing. And then we do have a team. Um, I'm just looking at through our website to try and see if I can <laughs> find it. And if I find it before the end of the server, I'll put it in there. But we do have a team that's specifically um, looking. And it was, some, it, it was created over the summer um, and headed by uh, a friend of mine who was already at the forum that's specifically focused on um, racial and social injustice. And I think they're going to be doing a lot more work in the near future. And maybe, maybe I can send a link to Theo and he can send it around, but they're, I, I think they just started work, but I think they were already doing some good stuff and I'm really looking forward to the work that they're doing. Um, Cause it's really cross sector, which is super important. So it's hope, you know, hopefully governments will take, account of the work, businesses will definitely take account of the work, and it's bringing in a lot of civil, civil society and giving them the platform to speak to global audiences about why this is important. Um, and Andrea, to your point, I just wanted to plug our next event, which is next week with a uh, Black economist, uh, Derek Hamilton. He's the head of the new school. Um, he's heading up their economics program. He will be speaking next week, so tune into that. Um, <laughs> just a quick plug there. Um, I think we have a question from your friend, Julie. Um, 
how do you think infrastructure plays a role in creating economic inequality and racism, specifically referring to the U.S., she said? Yeah, I mean, in addition to, you know, the kind of stuff I talked about earlier and the way that, um, you know, highways were built uh, over black neighborhoods to serve white communities in the suburbs, for a very long time, uh, infrastructure, uh, you know, across kind of infrastructure categories um, was not built with um, helping everyone in mind. It was sort of, it was sort of built helping, you know, white communities in mind. And th this ended up being a lot of the, uh, the, the power plants that, you know, emit, you know, dangerous uh, emissions and stuff were located most closely uh, to black neighborhoods. I mean, when I go to my, my, when I used to go to my grandmother's house in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, you could see the oil refinery, you know, out yeah. the back window. Um, uh, and, and, you know, it's been, the way that it's affected the US is, you know, both in transportation and so um, the needs of um, people in the suburbs to get into the cities. And of course the suburbs are allowed to make these laws that allow them white people to live there, um, prioritize uh, their needs. And there was big underinvestment in public transportation. Um, in a lot of cities. So uh, it was very difficult for um, black people who were kind of forced to live there to get around the cities and to get to new op job opportunities um, in other places. Um, and I think that, you know, now that the suburbs are much, much, much more diverse than they used to be, that's still a problem and that there's not that many transportation options to get people around to increase their wealth because they can't get to the jobs. Um, and I think, you know, with city services like uh, water. I think we saw that the way that Flint, Michigan, they just kind of ignored the problem yeah. there and, you know, let those people die. Um, you know, that's been uh, a major feature of U.S. infrastructure because I think of, of the way that uh, cities can uh, segregate themselves and, you know, people in the suburbs can a lot of times often just build their own infrastructure and cut off the city from their services that it just, and all the tax money ends up draining outwards. Um, and there's nothing left to reinvest. So it's been a huge problem. And, you know, I think hopefully uh, this will get solved as we change the face of cities. And I'm glad I'm seeing um, from Giselle this question about the 15 minute cities, because I do think that that is um, a really good opportunity um, to address some of these issues. Uh, and, you know, in, in some ways it's one of the benefits to having um, wealthy young white people move into the cities is something people care about how cities are designed. Um, uh, but the 15 minute city, for those of you who are unfamiliar, is a concept that's really pioneered by N. Hidalgo, the mayor of Paris, uh, that um, is basically everything that you need um, should be within a 15 minute walk of where you live in a city. So it's basically, you know, a bunch of 15 minute neighborhoods and that, you, you know, you're, uh, you can get your medical care, your kids can go to school, um, you know, your post office, your grocery store, um, public transportation that leads to other parts of the city. Um, I think that's going to be a really important concept and just making cities more integrated, making us more aware of the, of the way that we share cities with other people and giving people access to the services that they need. Um, and it's interesting because you see that the 15 minute city concept has really expanded um, to a lot of other places, uh, you know, everybody has their own version. That's uh, some version of a, a time scale, 15 minute, 20 minute, whatever. Um, but a, a lot more mayors are taking this more seriously as a way to develop their cities, particularly now that the pandemic has happened. And there's a lot of questions around what central business districts will look like. Uh, is, is office space gonna, gonna be used in the same way or are they gonna be, are a lot of real estate companies gonna say, hey, a lot of these companies are only really using this office space for a small amount of hot desks for people just coming in and out of and some conference rooms. We can turn the rest of this building into affordable housing, um, which is something that they did at the end of the fight at the, after the financial crisis downtown in New York in the financial district, um, a lot of those office buildings were converted into a part, not necessarily affordable housing, but were converted into apartment buildings because, um, you know, so many people went out of business. And so I think that's, I think they're considering a lot here and you'll see a lot of in other cities in um, Neom, which is the city in Saudi Arabia that they're just kind of creating um, out of thin air. That's part of a, a lot of the reforms that, that um, they're undertaking over there to diversify their economy. Um, they, they just came out with this really interesting um, we'll see what if it ends up having this really interesting city design called the line uh where basically they're just creating 
a, a really, really uh, long city. Um, mm -hmm. Mm. By long, I mean like like 50 miles long. Uh, and the idea is that everything, I'll go ahead and just put it in the chat here so that you folks can go and see what it looks like. Um, it, it, but it's supposed to be carless. And it's uh, back to that 15 minute city opportunity where everything, ev all of the services are kind of underground. And so it, because it goes along the entire city, everybody has access to them just by proximity. Um, and you should be able to get everything you need within walking distance. And then you can go anywhere in the city by just going down and getting on this, like, I guess it's one line of transport that goes up and down. So I think that idea um, is a good one in addressing a lot of the issues um, that we face in cities today. It doesn't necessarily require large scale uh, redevelopment of cities, which can be really disruptive. And as we know that uh, there's some communities that can handle the disruption much better than others. If you're, you know, a poor person who can't afford to miss work, um, need, you know, your community is a huge source of support for you um, and taking care of your family, it's much harder for you to deal with um, the kind of big projects that we, if we, you know, we just mow this over and make this a shiny new thing um, than if you're, you know, you're a wealthy person who can just pay someone to do all those things. Right. Yeah, appreciate that. Um, I kind of wanted to see if you've done any research um, recently around how I've seen a lot of stories come out recently, just how the pandemic has affected, you know, minority communities, specifically the black communities, disproportionately. Um, a lot of topics around increasing minimum wage now, um, just because a lot of these communities are in, you know, service oriented jobs, more front facing jobs, service oriented jobs. Um, can you just touch on like how this pandemic has kind of exposed some of these elements in your article a little bit more? I think some people read them, they don't realize, you know, this is something that has been going on for so much time, but you know, the pandemic has put them like front and center. You yeah. Know? No, that's, that's absolutely right. I mean, I think one of the um, things the pandemic has done is really just highlight all of these ongoing problems that we've had as a society, and particularly how um, black people and other minorities were treated. Um, uh, and, you know, like you were saying, the people who have been most affected uh, so far, who've had the highest death rates, uh, have been um, minority groups. Uh, and, um, you know, they make up most of the frontline workers and they are most disproportionately affected um, when the economy goes bad and when people lose jobs and it takes them longer, we see this in every session, it takes them um, longer to recover. And, you know, one of the things I find most interesting about um, the health aspect here is that it's another uh, situation that shows that the problem isn't necessarily economic, but there really is a, a, a big racism component to it because um, black people in particular's interactions with the health system have traditionally not been great. Uh, and this- Right, and you touch on that in the article a bit. Yeah, um, and I think a lot of, you know, when there's, there's a lot of articles now about vaccine hesitancy among- Exactly. Um, minority communities and, you know, it's not just uh, the, you know, the Tuskegee uh, syphilis experiments, uh, which, you know, play, uh, play a role in people being suspicious of, um, you know, doctors, but it's not, I think, in, in some quarters, and this is why it's important for people to be represented at all levels, because there's some reporters that are saying this, and I'm just like, well, you need to talk to your black friend. Um, but <laughs> it's not just kind of this, you know, vaguely conspiracy tinge thing about the Tuskegee experiments, but people's just day-to-day -day interactions, which is, what I was getting in the article with doctors uh, are tinged by racism. I mean, my my mom, when she was in the hospital with me, um, when she had me, uh, was the nurse came in and was about to give her a shot of penicillin. And my dad was in the room, who was white, and was like, don't give her penicillin. She's allergic to it. And the nurse just looked at him and then just gave her the penicillin. And then she was violently ill for a full day. Uh, and not only... Not only was it was my dad a white man, so that didn't help. My mom was also it was a local news anchor, so a very well known, famous, locally famous person, and it doesn't matter. She was just this black lady who didn't know what she was talking about. So you know, this is I think something that I would like to see more of the conversation be around is not just that you know, black people remember the Tuskegee 
experiments and that's why they're hesitant to get a vaccine. Like black people remember the last time they went to the doctor and that's why they're hesitant to get the vaccine. And they didn't have a black doctor who didn't seem to care um, about what their problems were. didn't seem to believe them when they told them what their symptoms were. Um, and the, you know, all of the medical textbooks are based off of the physiology of a white man anyway. So this is a problem that also <laughs> affects women majorly because they, you know, uh, symptoms of heart attacks present differently in women and men. Um, and, and it's just one of those things that's just like, uh, grinds my gears that way, that the conversation around, you know, the health of black people in this pandemic I started off in a good place, like, oh, there's all these disparities. And now it's coming to this place, like, oh, you know, we just need to help them trust the fact that it, this isn't a conspiracy. And it's like, it's not a conspiracy. You just need to fix the way that doctors deal with their patients. Right. Because we, then we have scenes like, I think there was a scene of the, she was a female doctor. Um, I think she actually died of COVID and she was telling um, the hospital staff that she was in pain, but the whole time they, I guess they ignored her and she was on social media telling people, yes, like I'm pain, they're not treating me, I'm a doctor and they're still not listening to me. And then you see stories come out afterwards saying that she was labeled aggressive by the hospital mm -hmm. staff and it's just like exactly. that stuff that, go, that all of that stuff goes into this hesitancy and then you hear about how black women you you gave your specific case when you were born but you hear about cases when they're having children and you know the nurses are not listening to them i'm in pain i'm in pain all of this goes into this conversation um and i i just feel like a lot of times it gets drowned out you know uh, it's, it, it devolves into, you know, the Tsiji experiment. It's like, no, there's other things that go yeah. into this conversation yeah. and we have to talk about them. Um, that also goes into the mental health um, situation as well. Um, and that's one thing that the BSU has kind of been trying to bring out this year. We've been trying to focus on mental health just because of the pandemic, what it's done to people. It's um, isolated, isolated people. It's making them feel, you know, isolated from the community. Um, I know students have reached out to me um, over the summer feeling isolated from size from their friends and all of that goes into the conversation. Um, so it's something that needs to be had. Um, and it's interesting that um, your article touched on it. it and you know, and, to, to have more and to bring this kind of back to the conversation about economics, the number from Australia, that 44.9 billion dollars lost the Australian economy because of racism. That number was calculated um, by uh, a university that I can't remember now, but um, instead of it, the way that the, the, the McKinsey number was done was a lot of like house values and lost consumption. This number was come up by the, the economic productivity losses because of the mental effects of racism. So mm -hmm. uh, they treated it basically as if, you know, the effects of going on disability and what that does to your um, production. Uh, and I think it's an undercovered aspect of, you know, the, the, having to deal with this day in and day out um, makes it harder for you to work as a black person. I think we all found it much more difficult to work during the George Floyd protests over the summer where we were, we were sitting here being like, how, are, how is this not consuming everybody else's life? It's all I think about. Um, and that, that mental health penalty is not just bad for you when you're doing your job, it's bad for a company. If they want you working at peak performance, they should care um, whether or not you can fully do this job without having these extremely heavy burdens placed on you. Exactly, exactly. Um, I don't see any more questions in the chat. We're coming towards the end of time. Um, Joe, I don't know if you had any um, closing comments that you wanted to give to the size community, um, size students. Um, maybe just, I, I kind of want to just, um, since a lot of us are second years, we want to get into this. Maybe just yeah. tell us how you've, uh, <laughs> yeah, the, any, any comments on like your last year at size and, you know, anything for second years to take away? Uh, I think, um, and yes, that too, uh, good point. Nick, Nick, Nick's work is someone, um, and he, we asked oh, him to be yeah. here today, but he's, I think, just crazy busy because he's actually setting up, he's working with McKinsey to set up a new, whole new um, practice based on uh, racial equity. So 
should definitely keep up with the work that Nick is doing. Yeah, Nick, uh, we did try to get Nick. Nick said he may have some time later on. Like Joe said, yeah. he's just super swamped right now. We may have yeah. another um, event with him later if he comes up for air. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. I mean, the, the, the report that they wrote, which I got a lot of my numbers from, one of the leads on that was the guy who's now the president of the Washington football team. Uh, so they oh, have wow. the firepower on that on that team. So they're doing great work. So keep an eye on them. Um, but I think you know the thing. Uh, the the only regret I have at SICE was taking classes I thought would get me a job uh, rather than ones that I liked. And there are some. I think sometimes I do wish I took corporate finance and I didn't. Um, but there are some like econometrics which I didn't really like and didn't want to do, but thought it would just get me in the door someplace um, when I should have just taken. And maybe, I don't know, it may be too late now because you've already decided on your classes. But um, just enjoying the time and the opportunity to just like talk about all the cool things you get to talk about at SICE. Because um, getting a job is always, uh, <laughs> it's always a struggle even when it's not a pandemic, I think. Um, so just stay open-minded uh, and be ready to, t to show people how your experience um, is useful in ways that they don't understand. I actually, I often say this, that uh, um, in my experience, uh, and the, you know, at the forum, this is, it's an international organization, so it's not necessarily relevant, but they were more known for hiring MBAs than international relations people. But I think my SICE experience comes in most handy um, because it's an organization that's very, uh, there's not a lot of structure. And so you've got to get a lot done by you know, working with people and influencing people and understanding diplomacy is a very important and very underrated part of any job. And I think you can tell when it's, when the MBAs just think that like, well, there's I, I, there a structure of employment and you do what I say, and this is how the, the framework works. And this will yeah. get it done because of the framework. And that's just not how it happens. And there's a lot of workplaces like that. So being able to just translate, you know, like I went to diplomacy school essentially and diplomacy is work and that's how you get things done. I think being able to relate, if it's not a traditional SICE job like State Department or the World Bank or an NGO, I think that's a, one of the things to highlight is it just it helps you <laughs> get through with life skills that I think your MBAs might not have uh, and are not as prepared to roll with the punches because you know half of our half of our schoolwork is just like solve this unsolvable geopolitical issue right. in favor and a lot of solving unsolvable problems I think is a good is a good exercise to undertake because it's not always going to lay out so neatly as it will um, in real life. And, and just going back to what do you think um, some of the, I guess, how do you think we move this conversation on racism like forward? How, how do we, how do we keep having progress on it? Just because I think we have a moment and I said this over the summer, like a lot of people are, are super honed in on this right now just because of what happened to George Ford. And it's, it, we have a lot of pledges right now. Like, how do we keep moving forward? I know we have movements, Black Lives Matter movements. Yeah. You said getting in there, continuing to, you know, how does us uh, students, how does society, how do we keep moving like this conversation forward? Um, I mean, in your opinion, in your opinion. Yeah, I mean, in my opinion, it is so much of it is really just normalizing this as a part of the conversation. It's like you were saying earlier in the US talking about race is so taboo, it makes people uncomfortable. Uh, and I think um, one of the things that I most enjoyed over the summer was seeing white friends take other white friends to the woodshed about institutional racism. Like I just had to sit there and I didn't have to say anything, which was <laughs> which is what I want to be. And so just getting past that taboo that it's an, that it's an uncomfortable conversation to have, I think is so important. And that's just bringing it into um, the conversations where it where it needs to be and just when you go out into the workforce just not being afraid um you know to where you feel comfortable um and that's what i think we should be creating more spaces for people to feel comfortable um but you don't you know don't be afraid to be like have we thought about this in the way that this is going to affect um black communities um and just making sure that it's a, a part of thinking going into the way the decisions are made um in any in any in any situation, I think that's really the way to push us forward. Aside from continuing to participate and make your voice heard and um, supporting all these broader movements, is in you know your personal like where you can, um, making sure the conversation is had and that people don't need to be afraid of it. You know, we don't need to, uh, 
this isn't a conversation about why I'm mad at you, person. This is a conversation about why we can make a better future for everybody, and, and but why you need to address um, this issue that's only affected my community. So, yeah. Great, great. I really appreciate it. I want to thank you all uh, for joining us today, joining the Black Student Union. Um, this is an amazing conversation. Um, some people already texted me. They're like, I'm really loving this event. This is great. <laughs> I'd love to have you back. Um, you know, if you continue to do some research, we'd love to hear how it evolved um, over sure. time. But I just sure. want to thank you. Yeah, and thank you. It was great to be with you all. Uh, I love SICE. I can tell you that SICE is famous for alumni that actually like it. My Columbia colleagues who went to SEPA, don't, they don't have the same thing going on as we do. So uh, uh, glad to be back and really excited to see, you know, the cool things that everybody's going to be doing in the future. And, you know, please feel free to reach out to me um, if I can help you. Um, may or may not be able to help you with uh, getting work at the forum. It's notoriously difficult, Julie could tell you, but, uh, you know, uh, here to be a sounding board if you need, um, and just really glad to be here. So thanks for having me. And to uh, Tara, yes, this uh, session will be recorded. And uh, before we end, I just want to say, um, you know, this is a sensitive topic, um, and I'm glad that we are tackling it today, and we are celebrating Black History Month, but I want to say that this affects a lot of communities, and we stand with our members in the Asian community of what's happening on the West Coast, um, completely condemn that violence against um, the Asian community out there. Um, we stand with you and, you know, hopefully we can continue, continue this conversation and have more understanding, not only for the black community, but the other minority communities in the United States. So um, I just want to add that in there. And I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Thank you again. And um, quick plug out for, we do have an event next week, next Thursday with Dr. Hamilton. Um, he is a black economist. He will speak a little bit more about how this has affected the black community, um, specifically the pandemic and what he kind of expects from the new administration um, economically um, to bring the black community into uh, more of a conversation with uh, economics. So uh, look out for that. I just want to plug that. Uh, and with that, I think we're going to end. Thank you so much, everyone. All right. All right, bye.